I'm, I'm going to ask this one. I already know the answer. Any stories about Dallas? <laughs> Any stories about well, no. As I as I as I told you, uh, they. Uh, I've had a lot of fun in Dallas. We had uh, one of our fraternities I won in Dallas one time. And uh, I always think of Dallas as a town where people know how to make money. And uh, they used to have a saying, if it's got a mouth, sell it. You know, uh, and so they weren't much. Although the greatest cowman, the biggest, the world's biggest cowman was C.C. Slaughter. And he lived in Dallas. He built that big uh, uh, hospital over there, that Methodist hospital, and uh, financed it. And it, at one time, he probably owned 40, 50, 60,000 head of cattle. He was George Slaughter's son, and George Slaughter freighted uh, Sam Houston's law books into Texas, and then went on to become quite a cowman. And there's still, uh, C.C. Uh, Slaughter's uh, heirs still ranch out in the country close to where I am. And they live in Dallas. When did you, when did you first go to Dallas? I'm just curious. When did what? When did you first go to Dallas? When did you first see it? Oh, uh, I, I, I'd probably after I went to riding cutting horses. One more story about Dallas. There was some uh, shysters uh, approached C.C. to buy his ranches and, and was giving him a whole lot of money. And uh, they, they signed the papers and he wrote a letter to his uh, foreman to turn the ranches over to these people. In the meantime, they had a two-day start. In the meantime, he found out they were shysters. He put his 12-year-old son on a horse. He made a 324-mile ride nonstop. The last horse he wrote, got was a dun stud off the ranch that I ranch now and rode him 125 miles and beat him, beat the guys up, and they had a two-day start of it. That was a, I don't know which slaughter boy it was, but it was C.C. Slaughter's son. He rode from Dallas to over to the ranch headquarters, was over north of Big Springs. That's a hard drive in a car. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot of cowboy uh, with Dallas, I guess, when you stop to think about it. I guess so. I guess so. How long have you been cowboy? Oh my life. Uh, I I can't remember when I wasn't riding the horse, and a lot of that time I wasn't a cowboy, but I thought I was. What's? I, I left home when I was 14 years old. Went to work for Proctor's, uh, greatest two cowmen and cowboys and ranchers that probably is ever in this country. And uh, James Kinney worked for him too. James was 15 years older than me and he, he worked for him before I did. And uh, they, uh, I, I tell everybody I left home when I was 14 with an uncluttered mind. That's a nice way of saying no education. And, and obviously, what was Texas like at, at 16 when you left with your uncluttered mind? <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. There was a lot more room and uh, lots of horseback and lots of cattle work, lots of good cowboys. Uh, and and uh, it, uh, it was more of a relaxed, uh, um, happier times. You didn't see anybody, didn't sing. Cowboys would sing, you know, and and you'd hear women, you know, they they would all sing as they're working. And uh, I, I guess this these radios and TVs and stuff is uh, showing everybody how bad they sing. <laughs> and, but uh, it was a it was a nobody had any money, but. Because nobody else had any money, you didn't miss it very much, you know. And uh, the uh, it was a it was right in that depression, and uh, everybody worked, and and uh, but it seemed like a, a a real good time. And there was big pastures then, and big ranches. 
and uh, uh, they, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was, James saw more of a change than I did, and men about that age. Uh, I, I remember one time this Dick Abbott that I said about getting killed a horseback out in North Town. He was about James' age, maybe a little older. And we had gone out here to a, a fellow's little old ranch out here. He had married a rancher's daughter, and he was a farmer. And they'd put him off on a little old sorry ranch just to get him out of the way, I think. And we had gone out there day working, and was in my old car, and, and uh, I noticed Dick got mad as quick as we got there. And uh, you can't bleep this, can't you? Oh, yeah. And uh, so we we worked three days, and Dick don't say a word to nobody, and I'm having a big time. And he's, he's just mad as he can be. Well, we're coming back to town, and it's dark, and he's sitting over in the corner. Directly out of the darkness, he says, I'm going to quit cowboy. And I said, why, Dick? He said, there's nobody got these righteous anymore except sons, son-in-laws, and sons of bitches. And that farm boy had made him mad, you know, because he, he didn't respect him as a cowboy, you know. And uh, uh, that, that's a, a big change. In other words, in his age, James's age, a cowboy was very essential. And he was very, a good one, was highly respected and treated as an equal. And as they come on in after the war, they tried to uh, uh, mechanize these ranches and kind of fenced them up and they lost a lot of uh, good cowboys. And, and But uh, we're getting them back now. Boy, there's more good young cowboys and more good horses going today than I've seen in the last 30 or 40 years. And uh, I mean good hands, good horsemen. And we've really got good horses now. We've really uh, improved the horses. And, of course, they had real good horses for what they was doing in those days, you know. But uh, I've seen people thought they could uh, handle cattle better mechanically, and they found out they can't. They found out there's no way to beat a horse, a handling cattle, and a good cowboy. So they've gone to respecting a good cowboy and a good horse and soliciting them. And, uh, and it's consequently brought back some real good hands. You know, I, I, I say they'll never be able to play, replace a cowboy because they don't build a machine that'll take that much abuse. And if you could, it'd cost a million dollars. <laughs> You've done this forever. Obviously, you like the work. What's special about being a cowboy? It's exciting. It's hard to to tell somebody and and make you feel that rush you feel, that adrenaline you feel. You know, like I was telling about that uh, roundup that uh, stampeded at James Kennedy's. Well, when you're riding over slick rocks. Uh, as hard and fast a horse can run, and it's a contest that it looks like they may win, and it's a real thrill, and it's exciting. And there, no days are alike. You see some of the most beautiful sunrises, some of the most beautiful sunsets. You see all kinds of hues, shadows, and, and uh, uh, shades of colors, uh, you know, just as the weather changes. And, uh, and there's nothing better than riding a good horse and working cattle. And, and it's always different. There's never two days alike. It's always something different. You know, I, I heard that uh, they, it was reported at a cattle raiser's convention, some fellow was talking, said this year's gonna be just like 1934 or something. And said there's an old fellow that had ran Swenson 60 years and he said, well, I've been writing 60 years. And said, I've never seen two years like it. You know, and that's right. I've never, since I went to Cowboy, and I'm, since I went to writing, I've never seen two years like it. It's always a learning experience. It's always a challenge. And, and somebody's, you know, you always got to keep moving, keep learning, keep, keep 
and it's new all the time. Um, I, I have to ask if you have a Texas Rangers story. Well, it, it uh, my favorite one is about the, uh, uh, I read about it, and it's supposedly a true story, and I, f I forget the ranger's name, but he was, a, he was famous for being a cool-headed, clear uh, leader, and they, he woke up one morning surrounded by a little red flag army out of Mexico, uh, about 200 soldiers, and he had about 15 men. And they rallied together and got saddled and got ready for battle. And he was a very Christian man. And he got out on his knees and he said, Lord, help us. Help us with this fight. And said, if you can't help us, don't help those Mexicans over there. Sit on that hill and watch the damnedest fight you ever saw. And I changed that to soldiers. That's a cute story. <laughs> huh? Now that was your favorite. What's your second favorite? What? That was your favorite uh, Texas Ranger story. What's your second favorite? I, I use that, you know, uh, when I'm wanting to get people to have perseverance. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, Well, you know, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, and I've got some more, but I just can't think of them. I'm just, uh, uh, you know, what, one of the most colorful rangers that was that Frank Hammer. And, you know, he led the deal that uh, got killed Bonnie and Clyde. He came out of retirement for it. And he married a Johnson girl up there. Those people are neighbors of mine up there. And, you know, he was such a uh, cool-headed, Scrapper, and one time after he married Mrs. Johnson, or no, she wasn't Johnson at that time. She was Mrs. Sims, and uh, she had uh, uh, shot her husband and didn't kill him, but her brother shot him and killed him. And they were having a trial over at Adelaide, and Miss Sims had hired somebody to kill Hammer and her, and they uh, they ambushed him in Sweetwater. They drove under a filling station back then. There used to be buildings like that, and, and it, you could drive out. You might remember them. They drove under there, and they got out to go to the restroom, and his brother was with him, and he went across the street. And Hammer started around the car, and this one guy stepped up to him with a shotgun, pulled the trigger, and, and of course, he's so close, that shot had stayed together, and just cut Hammer's hat brim off. Well, it kind of blinded him, and uh, uh, the guy shot him in the right shoulder with a pistol. Well, Hammer had, uh, Hammer was of course right-handed, but he had stuck a little 32 pistol in his, and he reached uh, in here and he had reached with his left hand and he went to his knees when the guy shot him and he first shot, he shot the guy right between the eyes. And another guy came at him and he whirled around and shot him right between the eyes. And the grand jury was in, in session in Sweetwater, and they had came to the window and was watching, and they went back and no building. <laughs> that was Frank Hammer you were talking about. Yeah, Frank, Frank did you, Hammer. Did you ever meet Frank? No, no, he was, he was full of my time. But, uh, and there's sure a lot of good stories about him that I... Like, but I can't think any of them now. Other than now, you were telling a whole bunch of stories out there. What's your favorite? About what? You pick it. What's your favorite story that's out Oh, I don't know. It just depends on the crowd and <laughs> what's going on, you know. Uh, I had a lot of fun. had a lot of experience. Uh, you know, I, one of the, they were talking about that stampede and there was always a saying, and that a cowboy should never get a foot. And they say that the old time cowboy was, wasn't afraid of anything except two things. He said, one of them he's afraid of being put a foot, and the other one he's afraid of a good woman. 
<laughs> and, and those were the only two things he's afraid of. But they always had a saying, don't, don't ever get down a foot around cattle. Don't ever get off your horse. And uh, that stampede, uh, James has caused that. And, and three of us caused a stampede one time with 3,500 cattle. I mean a big herd of cattle. And by getting a foot. But it makes me think of a story that uh, Charlie Russell had in his book, Trails Plowed Under. He said old cowboys would always stick together. He said it didn't make any difference that if they met in uh, Chicago and one of them was a known cow thief and the other one was a big rancher, they'd go together like lost brothers, you know. And uh, he, he said that one time there was, and said most old cowboys that got old uh, would come town tin bar. That was something they could do. And he said one time there was one of them tin in bar in Mon Montana and, and uh, the Texas trail herd came in there. And they were getting oiled up pretty good. Four or five of them boys decided they better go get their horses and get in there and lighten things up. So they did, and they got in this saloon, and they was shooting, you know, and, and bumping people. And there was an Eastern drummer there with a little hat on, a little pill hat on. And one of these cowboys hit him with his horse and slid him down the bar, you know. And that bartender was standing down there, and this guy said, what are you letting these guys in here on these horses for. Said so that old cowpuncher looked back at him and said, what are you doing in here afoot? Very good. And it's clean. Yeah, we can use that. We can use that, yeah.